We're going to open up our Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 this morning. We're going to continue in this letter that Paul wrote to uh, this church that's found in Macedonia. It's the first church established in Europe, and the first convert was Lydia in Europe. And we don't need to look too far uh, back into history to discover the impact that Christianity had uh, in Europe. Uh, that's uh, uh, something I probably don't even need to mention. God had a plan. He did not allow Paul to go into Asia. And when Paul uh, had the doors shut and going in that area in that direction, the Lord showed him a vision of a Macedonian and said, come help us. So Paul shows up in that area uh, that would be known today in modern Greece. And he begins uh, in his missionary journeys uh, one of the most successful uh, ministries uh, that uh, can be found in the Bible. As he get, not only writes to the Philippians, he also writes to the Galatians, and he also writes to the Thessalonians, and then, of course, he moves and goes uh, west uh, uh, toward Rome, and there's a Roman letter, and so uh, Paul's calling uh, was not in vain. God, God never asked us to do anything that he's not going to bless. We find then in this particular chapter, and I do want to read um, one particular verse, and it's going to be found in chapter 2, and let's see here, um, let's look at the first four verses, if we, st we can stand. The first four verses, we're going to build off of this, and, uh, and then uh, see what the Lord has to say to us. So Philippians chapter 2, it's good to see everybody. How's it looking up here? It looks a little different, huh? Yeah, yeah. It looks, looks like a new church. <laughs> it's amazing what paint will do, right? <laughs> so uh, thank you to those guys, uh, Ivan and Marcos, uh, who helped out. Olga was here too. And, uh, and then Israel sent pizza, so we're thankful for that. And then uh, following up at the, their, uh, uh, our, our sister Estela and Camila, they came and helped clean up too. So everybody is participating in making this place a uh, place that we can come and worship the Lord and we can bring honor to him. Amen. That's the whole point. This bring glory and honor to Christ. Okay, so here's what it says. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, we're just going to look at the first four, four verses and that's going to kind of launch us off into the rest of this chapter. So, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We're going to leave it right there, and then you'll see how the rest of this is built off of this first part that Paul writes. Let's pray. Let's pray for God's blessing this morning. Uh, precious Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for this Sunday morning. We thank you, Lord, for those that have made it, uh, that are here uh, physically, in person, in the building. Um, and we do pray also, Lord, for those that, for whatever reason, weren't able to make it and possibly they're watching online. So we ask you to bless them, be with them, be with us, Lord, and help us to see more of Jesus. Help us to become more like Jesus. And we pray, Lord, and ask your protection as we open your word. We ask your, um, the, your blessing and that the Spirit may um, uh, work freely in this place. And we pray, Lord, for every provision that we need, spiritually speaking. Bless us, we pray, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may have a seat. So, chapter 2 is known um, um, for uh, a word that's mentioned here, kenosis. Uh, the word you'll find uh, in this passage is actually found in verse 7 where it says he emptied himself. Kenosis is the Greek word and it's really important because it's going to drive the whole 
meaning of what's going on here. So it's known as the kenosis passage. Or it's uh, mentioning and brings to mind the incarnation of Jesus Christ. His, his appearance. His visit to this world, this fallen world. Uh, it describes the word kenosis again. It describes Jesus emptying himself. I want you to think about that for a while. It describes how he was willing uh, to come and offer his life as a sacrifice for our salvation. So my prayer is that we would appreciate and also um, thank God for his grace that's demonstrated in the fact that Jesus literally stooped down to offer fallen man an extended hand of mercy. The image here is that the Father in Jesus stooped down. He bent over and extended a hand of mercy to fallen humanity. Whereas our reach could not reach Him. We had no access to Him. We had no way of reconciliation outside of Jesus appearing in person, in human form. We'll see more of that later. So the, ver the first four, four verses here, Paul's trying to encourage the Philippians. as uh, He was always good at that. I think it's the job of the pastor to encourage the congregation, to exhort them. It's kind of like to, um, to urge you and hopefully persuade you to, to follow this path. What's the path? Uh, it's the path that, uh, of unity, the path of humility, um, which uh, we'll see here, the path of love. Uh, we'll see also of that. Uh, it, all of that uh, is described in the service and sacrifice of Christ. In other words, Paul is going to illustrate the life of Jesus to remind them that in the incarnation, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice uh, to humanity, and that's the example we're to follow. Amen? Let me say that again. Maybe I'll, re I'll reword it a little bit. Jesus is the ultimate example of selfless humility, and it was demonstrated in his service when he sacrificed himself. And so Paul is saying, if you guys want to know how to do Christianity, look to Jesus. Amen? My prayer, whenever I get up here and teach, that I could always bring it back to Christ. Amen? It's not that his Christianity is not about cute little formulas and little things that we do. It's about a relationship with Christ. It's about looking to him and observing how he loved us how He desires for us to be unified, how He desires for us to, to um, be able to um, also extend from our lives service to those around us. And we're going to see a little bit more of that. So look at what it says, uh, starting again at verse 1. If there's any encouragement in Christ, it's a kind of a good thing to be encouraged in Christ. Our encouragement comes from the Lord. Any comfort uh, from love? There were those that needed comfort, and the way to comfort them is through love. Um, any participation in the Spirit? Participation meaning fellowship. Obviously, the only true fellowship that we can have is when we're led by the Spirit. And then affection and sympathy. Notice all the words there. Uh, completely contrary to what we witness on, in our world today, where there's competition and envy and conflict and contention hey who's what we're witnessing right now in Ukraine is the worst of humanity completely the opposite of what the Lord would want uh, among people among nations however he did warn that in the last days there would be an acceleration and rumors of wars and we could be witnessing the beginning of the last stage before his return. So while we're waiting and unfortunately praying and for, for God to do something because it's 
an intervention of some sort because there are people suffering and there are people jockeying for position and power and influence and it's it, it's it's the complete opposite of what Jesus did in his demonstration to us on the cross of how to treat others. I mentioned in Galatians, and again, it seems like it's impossible to get away from. It really matters to the Lord how we treat others. It's important, and especially in the church, because then we're the ones that have to demonstrate and be an example to a world that doesn't know him Amen? So it said, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort uh, from love, any participation in the Spirit, any uh, affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He says that again, right? So this is why I'm saying that what we see here is Paul asking the Philippians to be United, to, to have love, to have humility, which describes as service, to serve one another, to consider others more important than ourselves. There's a movie about Gail Sayers. I don't know if anybody you know a little bit about football back in the uh, 60s. <laughs> and um, he used to play for the Chicago Bears. And there's a teammate of his, Brian Piccolo, who passed away of cancer, and it's a story of their relationship. And in that movie, Brian Piccolo describes and says that he is, and he wrote a book, it's actually called I Am Third. I Am Third. Who, who's first? God's first. Who's second? Others. Who's third? I am. So that movie reminds me uh, uh, of what Paul's saying here. If, if there is uh, a path to follow in, in uh, unity and in love and in humility, it, the example is seen in the service and sacrifice of Christ. Because Jesus describes his mission as being obedient to the Father. When he became a man, he was serving the Father's will and purposes for fallen humanity and offering himself as the only way out when he offered himself at Calvary's cross as a payment for our debts, our sins, our iniquities fell on him according to Isaiah 53. Jesus did that for not just love for us, obviously, but he also did it in obedience and love for his father. Because there was no plan B. There's no second option in salvation. There's only one name under heaven by which man might be saved, and it's Jesus Christ. And I think that was what he was wrestling with in the Garden of Gethsemane. When he said, hey, uh, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, Father... He mentions in, in his agony and that he actually is under such stress that he bled tears of blood. He, he would say, uh, nevertheless, not my will, but let your will be done. As he said that the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. The spirit was uh, pushing him toward the goal, toward the mark uh, of his uh, calling of his, and the reason for his coming. And he was wrestling there. And if we were to put that in human terms, like what we might describe that experience of, it was like, hey, God, is there like a plan B? Because if there is, because he's the only man that knew how he would die and when and how. And yet he, when he was on bended knee in Gethsemane, praying this prayer, knowing uh, his passion to come, his suffering to come, when Judas shows up with the high priest and the Roman guards and they call out his name, he did not run or cower, did not hide behind a tree or a rock or flee down the creek. 
He stood up and said, I am. Tying into the Old Testament name that God gave Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am. And he stood up and he literally put out his arms and his hands and take me. He didn't resist. So what we're going to see here then, Paul is going to use the example of Christ to demonstrate to us how to live in unity and love how to live with humility and service toward one another. Again, our example is always Jesus. And if we want to know what Christianity looks like, you don't need to go further than Christ. That's it's not about rules and regulation, do do this and don't do that. That comes, what you should do and don't do, that comes when you follow Christ and your salvation produces fruit. But it doesn't save you, it proves you are saved. That is the fruit. Right? So let's look at this a little bit deeper. He says uh, in verse number three, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit because some people are motivated. We saw it in chapter one. There were some pastors and teachers that had come in after him in Philippi and they were competing with one another their motivation was wrong he says no don't do anything from selfish ambition uh, like I need to have a, my name high up and lift it up no 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 I don't even want you to know my name when I come to preach here Who, what's that pastor's name I don't know some guy that preaches about Jesus oh, okay that's good enough for me we hear pastors pray before they preach and say, Oh Lord, hide me behind the shadow of the Christ and let it be Christ who is seen and not the man and let it be your voice that speaks and not mine, not my opinions or my uh, ideas, but let it always be you and your word and your promises. Right? That's, that's all I want to know. That's all I want to do. So he says um, don't do anything from selfish ambition or conceit but in humility humility count others as more significant than yourself and let me put it this way service is impossible without humility sacrifice is impossible unity is impossible love is impossible uh, without humility Jesus gave us that example and we're to consider others more significant than ourselves you see that up there on the screen at verse 3? Others are more important than we are in the Christian example and model of Christ. That's how we find success in Christian living. That's how we conduct ourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel, right? The which we've been called to. We're an others-based faith. Amen. I'll let that sink in a little bit. Look, verse 4, each of you, uh, rather, let each of you look not only to his own interest. He's not telling us that we shouldn't take care of those things that interest us, but he's also telling us, but also to the interests of others. Others are just as important as we are ourselves. And it goes back to the, 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 the first uh, uh, commandment right uh, as the young rich uh, lawyer came to Jesus and said hey what must I do that I might inherit eternal life or the kingdom of God he says uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your might uh, soul and strength and then your neighbor as yourself putting both commands on equal pairing and you can't love your neighbor as yourself unless you actually love God so the vertical relationship needs to be healthy so that then our horizontal relationships are also I can always when it comes to counseling and there's issues and conflict and contention and stuff going on that's not right I can always go back to hey and I do say how's your relationship with the Lord and then we find out that not doing too well well that's why uh our horizontal relationships or relationships that we have with each other, how we treat each other, uh, it's 
identified easily by you doing an evaluation on how things are going with you and God this way, vertically speaking. It's just the way it works. <laughs> That's why he says, first to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then your neighbor as yourself. Right? So that's what he's saying. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he says in verse 5, and we're going to move now into one of the most amazing portions of scriptures in which I've studied for years and years as not just a pastor, but even before that it completely fascinates me. Is he says, have this mind in, among yourselves. He goes, I want you to think like this. This is the attitude or the perspective that you need to have among yourselves. Not just you, but yourselves. All of us collectively. We all need to think this way. Uh, which is yours in Christ Jesus. By the way, he's reminding us that we have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Who, referring to Christ, now notice, this is where the example comes. Though he was in the form of God... Let me just stop there for a minute and uh, describe this a little bit. Jesus Christ is who we're looking at here. When we look at the model of service so that we might know how to be unified and how to love and what humility looks like in, in our service, because that's what the first four verses are referring to, Jesus is the one who is our example. And it would be okay if I'm sitting here and I'm going to... I got my good friend Steve right here, so he, I'm going to use him as an example. If you want to know what a good takedown is in wrestling, uh, I, I wanted to know back in the day. He's a good example. He goes for those ankle picks. Right, Steve? Yeah. <laughs> I can use you as a good example of maybe an ankle pick and a takedown, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty fast. He's like a cat. Then I go falling over. Well, that's one thing that I can compare myself or look for an example on, among my peer. But here we're looking at who is the one we should model, and he's not just anyone. The Lord himself, God himself in the person of Jesus Christ is the one that we're looking at. If he was able to do this, and this is what Paul's alluding to, then it should not even be a question for us. Because look what he did. It says, have this mind among you which is in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, what that actually means when you use form, it implies he was his essence was intrinsically God. He was God, right? Hebrews, uh, let me just, we're talking about the incarnation here now. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He who was eternally preexistent as God is God today, is God forever, and how always has been. This is what we're looking at as far as Paul's concerned. He says he did not count equality or being equal with God a thing to be grasped. Well, we've got to kind of search this out a little bit. The Greek word for equality defines things that are exactly the same in size, in quantity, quality, character, number, and in every sense, here's what Paul is saying, that Jesus is equal to God. Look at the word equality. Right? Right? And consistently claimed during his ministry that he was. I and the Father are one. And what did he do? This one that was equal to God. This one that was uh, eternally preexisted as God. What did he do? And here comes the word that we're going to look at for a few minutes. That's the core of this second chapter he emptied himself. Just think about a pitcher of water. He literally emptied himself. The word is kenosis. That's the word I referred to earlier. What does it mean that he emptied himself? And these are the kinds of things that I like to look at and hopefully get you to understand so that you too then can model that example. Emptied himself refers to that he 
set aside his divine prerogatives and privileges. He didn't lose them. He set them aside. It's like if I were to go over here and take this little vase and just set it aside. It's not on the counter there anymore. But it still exists. It's right there behind it. He set aside his divine prerogatives and privileges. Or he laid aside his heavenly glory, his kingly robes, his crown. Why? Because we're talking about the incarnation, right? Because he needed to make a visit because there were sinners who needed salvation that only he could supply. There was a debt that needed to be paid for the redemption of man that nothing else could satisfy God's wrath and payment or appease because the penalty of sin is what? Death. Now, if we understand that, then the blood of Jesus is the only legal tender of heaven that the Lord would accept for payment. And it's good for all transactions, especially those of fallen man. If we can look at God's economy, silver and gold are not as precious as the blood of Jesus, even though there are commodities in this world that are very valuable. Amen? So, the Son of God, we see, in emptying Himself, had no feelings of self-aggrandizement. In other words, He didn't think Himself too good because of who He was. He not threatened by the fact that He would empty Himself in His relationship with the Father. His position as the one who was in the form of God, uh, is not something that he felt would somewhat threaten him because it wouldn't be continuing or uh, it would be interrupted and he would no longer have parity in heaven uh, or something that he selfishly was uh, guarding or holding on to or cherished, right? Because he understood that the salvation of our souls was at stake. So Jesus was willing to undertake the heavy assignment, the burden of the incarnation where he emptied himself, well, he literally reduced himself into a human as so that he could atone us, save us from our sins. He did it for us. So we need to realize who it is that did this so that we would appreciate and then have a sense of humility of what it cost for Jesus to rescue fallen humanity. Amen? So, <laughs> I don't know if that helps this morning. It all matters who did it. Not only what was done, but who did it. Jesus Christ, God in heaven, becomes as we read in John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word. The Word is capitalized. The word Word is capitalized, meaning it's a title. The Word be, was with God. So there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Word was God, equal to God, as Paul is alluding to in Philippians chapter 2, right? He was in the beginning with God. He says it again. Like, hey, this is important. He was all eternally preexistent. He, he was, he, he's always been. All things were made through him, so he is the agent through which creation was made. And without him, think about this, without him, nothing, not anything made was made. So who's Jesus? He's the creator of the universe. Amen? The creator of the universe empties himself. What? Hold on a minute. Well, that's, a, that's a little bit too big for my little tiny puny brain. Who emptied himself? I mean, it's no big deal if I decided to let you borrow my car. I, I'm not, it's not that big a deal. 
Uh, it's not much. <laughs> but this is the one who is the king of heaven. He left that throne in heaven. Right? Did not consider it a thing to be grasped. But he let go so that he could come in the incarnation and become as John the Baptist identified him. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Otherwise, there's no sin that can be taken away because he's the only one that could erase it. As Colossians says, he canceled the transactions or the debt or those um, rules and laws that were against us. He cancels them in, in his sacrifice. Then the most powerful verses, I think, that allude to the incarnation, that talk about how Jesus emptied himself, how he left his throne in glory, are found in verse 14 of John 1, where it says, And the Word became flesh. And what did he do? He dwelt among us, or the Word literally means tabernacled among us, giving us a, uh, an alluding to us the Old Testament tabernacle that dwelt among Israel. He tabernacled. He took upon himself a tent of human flesh. Like, well, if you go and do a study on the tabernacle, there is made of skins of animals, different animals, to allude to the humanity of God that would one day dwell in a body. And Jesus would also call his body the temple of God. And he would say to where the Pharisees and the high priests and the le religious leaders of, of Israel didn't understand where he looked at the temple that Herod had built. He said, destroy this temple in three days. I'll build it up again. And they were like, what? How is he going to do that in 40? We took us 40 years. He wasn't talking about the building made out of stone. He's talking about his own body, the temple of God. So we got to see here a picture of who it is that emptied himself. Who it is that offered himself as a sacrifice. Who it is that served the Father and served us so that we might be redeemed by his humility and love and sacrifice. See, again, the whole point of what Paul is trying to make is, hey guys, you should be unified. You should be uh, fellowshipping. You should be... Uh, Serving, and you know, how do you do that? Love. And how, what's love look like? Look at Jesus. His sacrifice is unconditional. Agape love. That's how we do it. And we who have received Christ, we who have voluntarily said yes to the gospel, we should understand then, because when we do say yes by faith to the gospel message, He gives us the promised spirit and that spirit that dwells in us teaches us to also love. This is impossible, humanly speaking. We're led by the spirit down this path. Amen. And we chose it. We volunteer. We say, oh, I'm in. Of course, it's all through the drawing of the Father, because no man comes to me except my Father draw him. Obviously, we didn't do it on ourselves. We yield, we submit ourselves to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we learn more about God through His Word. So, what does it say here? Um, it says here that He, Jesus, He became flesh and dwelt among us. And what do we see in Jesus? And we have seen His glory... The glory of God is found in Christ. You want to know what God is like? Look at Christ. Again, he's our example. Glory as to the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is grace and truth demonstrated. Again, this is the mystery of the incarnation. Again, he stooped down to fallen man. He was subject, that is Jesus, to hunger. He was subject to thirst. He was subject to being weary. And he was subject to, to pain. And he was subject to temptation. Yet the Bible teaches us that he was without sin. Right? And in verse 7, we continue there. It says he was taking the form of a servant. He was, he was being born in the likeness of men. Right? He could have come as a king. I mean, like, you know, on a chariot or something. Trumpets blowing, 
red carpet laid out. But how did he come? He came as a babe in a manger. Because there was no room for him. Imagine that, the creator of the universe. There was no room for him in the inn. Better yet, no one made room for him. Yeah, obviously no one knew. That's the point. That's the humility. He didn't say or it was never ever mentioned by Jesus, don't you know who I am? He was just a servant. Following through obediently to the Father's plan for the salvation of man. I think Billy Graham was saying that his birth, if we were to compare it to who he was, was equal to someone handing you a gift in a brown paper bag. Right? Nothing special on the outside. But boy, what was on the inside is unbelievable. It's Jesus equal with God. Hebrews 2.16 says something interesting. For truly he took not on him the nature of angels. De Jesus didn't even come as an angel. By the way, angels don't have the blessing and opportunity to be redeemed because they're unredeemable. The fallen angels will, will go with the father of lies to their ultimate destination in God's judgment. They, they, they're not redeemed. They were not redeemable. But he took on himself the seed of Abraham. A man. As a matter of fact, that promise back in chapter 12 of Abraham of the one who would come, the seed that would bless all nations, in which God would establish Israel through Abraham. We know the stories. That's the seed. That's the nature that he took. And he being in human form, verse 8, let me try and explain this. I, I, I do this sometimes during Christmas when we talk about the, the, the Christmas story, the nativity story, right? We, the invisible God was made visible. Uh, Moses wanted to see him when he was up in the mountain receiving the law, and God wouldn't allow him. But he said, I'll let you see my backside, the shadow of it, m most likely. Because in his human form, Moses wouldn't have been able to to deal with it, his, he probably would have been a crispy critter. So the invisible God was made visible, the eternal one, the one who's always existed. He places himself into time and space. The great I am becomes a servant. And we know that God had a divine appointment with humanity in the person who he mentions to Mary, his mother, called Emmanuel, God with us. So what we find in the incarnation and what we find in the example of Jesus is that he shows up. He's present. You know what's the most healthy thing a family can experience to be healthy? Again, repeating myself. That both mom and dad are present. Because it's about relationships. Where there's the most damage when the research is concluding, uh, when we ask ourselves why there's so many men in prison, and we're starting to find the same to be true now for girls, and they're actually more aggressive than men, is the absence of a father. But our Heavenly Father sent us His Son, and who we have present who appeared the one who made a visitation was God himself he had an appointment with humanity right and he met it on that morning or that evening when Jesus was born the shepherds announced it as they were uh, receiving the announcement from the angels so God with us Emmanuel it, it talks to us about God who made himself part of the universe that he had created and he did so so that he might redeem us. He, he journeyed far. So let me put it this way. I'm going to kind of compare it to something that we can relate to. It, it's like if I want to provide, uh, I don't know, my neighbor texts me and says, hey, can you bring over some Sugar? Sugar? <laughs> better be nice and I go out my door and next door I don't know what's how far could it be 
That's me going next door to provide sugar to my neighbor who doesn't have any, and he's right in the middle of making a cake. Now, anybody think that's a big deal? It's nice, right? But then that would be akin or equal to, let's say, if we, had, we lived in a kingdom, king going to my neighbor to provide them with sugar, but they live 93 million miles away. I mean, I'm just saying, the distance is not geographical. The distance that Jesus traveled from his heavenly throne to man represents a humility that's not even able to be comprehended. How far he went to save us matters. And we can't do a kind act or we can't join together. We should and hopefully we are. And that's my prayer for this church. We cannot provide a sacrifice or service to one another for God's glory after all that he did for us. That's what Paul's alluding to. We should, and we're going to, and we are. So he presents himself. And what we learn from what Paul is saying is this, that it's not man who reached God, but rather God who reached man, so that he might bring his, us back to him in reconciliation and restoration. So he humbled himself, it says there, uh, by becoming obedient to the point of death, and then Paul is, is smart and wise. And then he describes the kind of death, which is death of a cross. The most cruel, inhumane way for someone to die in that time and possibly in all history. It's not just that he died, it's how he died. And he was tempted, obviously, by his uh, adversaries and by those who didn't even know what was going on. Hey, you saved others, don't you save yourself? Hey, if you are the son of man, hey, one of the criminals on the right or left side of him said, hey, uh, save uh, uh, me and let's save ourselves. And Jesus never said a word. He just stayed there because he was there, not because the nails kept him on the cross. Love did. Amen? And then, of course, Paul goes on and says, therefore, when we see what Jesus did to demonstrate humility, to demonstrate obedience, to demonstrate love, he says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, notice it says every name should, uh, uh, rather, uh, every, um, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth, and in every tongue confess. Every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And guess what? Here's the good news. Those of us that have received Christ do it voluntarily. You know that? Have you done that? Have you bowed your knee to Christ? Have you confessed that He is Lord? Because there's two people categorized in this world. Those that do it by free will, and I always like to preface it, as you're guided by the Holy Spirit, and then those who will do it at the day of judgment. Everyone's going to do it. What matters is when and where. And we have this position, this amazing blessing and privilege to have done it by faith through our free will that God has given us. He has enabled us by the Holy Spirit to be able to. You know what the difference is when Jesus says, many are called but few are chosen? Because the Lord calls many, but he can only choose those who 
choose him through their confession of faith and their bowing of their knee. There's a condition in salvation. We must say yes. There isn't anything we can do for our salvation. It's all been paid for by in the cross. All we can do is acknowledge and confirm the truth that he is Lord. Amen? So, we'll take this all, all back around and we'll see that the lowest point of Jesus' humiliation was the crucifixion. It was a violent means of punishing and degrading and it was the lowest of criminals that they put on the cross. Yet, the Bible tells us here that God raised Jesus to eventual praise and universally speaking for all eternity, Jesus' humble death his burial and resurrection for our sins is at the very center of our message of the gospel. So it's not just that he came, but that he died. And not just that he died, in which he did and was necessary for our redemption, but that he rose in power, which is God's stamp of approval, justifying who Jesus said he was and what he did, so that he would sit forever at the right hand of the Father. And those of us that will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what it's telling us. Not will be, might be, could be. No. If you accept the finished work of Christ, it is finished. It is complete. Have you done that today? Have you done that in the past? If you haven't, my altar calls are fairly simple. God's already working in your heart. I don't need to know who it is. But if you do happen to be able to say today that which you never have. Hey, I want Jesus in my life. However way you able to analyze all this and put it together and process it, I don't know how you do it. But God is working. If you can say yes to Jesus, you're saved. And accepting his sacrifice for you and confessing your sins. And because you do confess your sins, you're acknowledging that you need to turn from them. That's called repentance. And follow him, then you are a child of God. Let me know about it so I can pray with you. Amen, and we'll see you again next week. Let me just wrap it up. So, since we're one with Christ, we should have the same mind as Christ, which means we have the same love. There's no rivalry, as Paul alludes to in the first four verses. There's no conceit. There's only us prioritizing the interests of others above our own. And Paul is showing us that this lifestyle of humility is what the Lord is requiring of us. And if we live in this fashion here in the church, God's going to be able to use us as vessels to reach not only our families, but our community. The world needs to see the love of Christ. The world needs to see the agape, the unconditional love of Christ. The world is so empty and so desperate right now. There are no answers out there. You get one thing from one place and another from another and now fake news and what's being said by that side and this side. Well, no one knows what's true. I know it's true. Jesus Christ said, I am the truth. When you know him, you'll be able to discern what's going on out there. And you'll be at peace and you'll have joy because you have the one who said, I am the truth, and you'll have that joy unspeakable. You'll have peace because that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. And we just keep marching forward until he calls us home or we meet him sooner. Another way, as Paul would indicate here, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. He was in a prison when he wrote this, ex waiting on his execution. It didn't matter. He said, either way, if I live, I get to keep ministering to you, which is helpful to you. If I die, hey, I win. Church, let's have the mind of Christ. Amen? Let's work together for the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you. These uh, ideas that are presented to us by Paul, the incarnation, the, the mystery of it all, Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming to, to get a grip of exactly the degree to which Jesus humbled himself. But we only need to be responsible for humbling ourselves where we're at with what we have and nothing more. 
So give us opportunities, Lord, to serve. Give us opportunities, Lord, to love. Give us opportunities, Lord, to work together for the sake of the gospel. And help us, Lord, by your spirit to do these things so that we might accomplish the great commission, Lord, right now in a time where it is urgent, where people are lost and in darkness and really don't understand anything and uh, confused and worried and full of anxiety and stress and burdened. And we see all that, Lord, going on. Help us, Lord, to share with them as we do with a calm, joyful, peaceful disposition because we know that we're in your hands. That nothing comes to us, Lord, except you permit it. Help us, Lord, to be able to be that light, that salt in the world that needs it, that's dark. We thank you, Lord. We pray and ask these things. And for those, Lord, that may have in their hearts today, uh, as you have been dealing with them, made a decision for Christ, my prayer, Lord, is that you would strengthen them and establish them and uh, that they would continue, Lord, to grow in their relationship with you. And those of us that know you, that we would be strengthened and encouraged also to continue to move forward, to press toward the mark. Because you're coming soon, Lord, and we want to be able to present you something to honor you and to bring glory to your name. You're going to ask us, Lord, as you did in the uh, parable of the talents, what did we do with Jesus? What did we do with the gospel? In what form do we serve you in uh, bring honor to you so father we pray lord that we would not be ashamed on that day we thank you lord for the privilege we thank you lord for the opportunity to serve you and we ask to use us as vessels and we ask that you lord would be lifted up and the people would only see you and we thank you in jesus name amen